A warm welcome. I mean, welcome back, Jerry. Jerry was here two years ago, and his novel had just been published, Emma in the Big Home. Really happy he's here with us again. Since then, three or four more books have appeared. Um, Jerry is one of our most versatile writers in a variety of genres. Um, a biographer, poet, a novelist, um, and a translator from Marathi to English. Uh, his talk today is titled Other Words, Other Voices, and where he has uh, promised to reflect on what it means to presume different persona um, that he has done in this various literary efforts. Jerry. Hi. Thank you. I like, is someone whistling for me? <laughs> uh, sorry, can you hear me? Yeah? Okay, great. Uh, thank you. This is very, uh, this feels strange. It, always when you're at a podium, it feels like you have something important to say to the world. But the important things are in the books, actually. But now that I'm here, I, I want to start by talking about how language is taught in India. Uh, languages are taught in India fundamentally, despicably. They are taught really badly. The result has been that in most Indians I know are orphans in their own language, which means they cannot speak, read, write, or express themselves in their own language. And they often cannot read, write, or express themselves in a, the, the language in which they have been educated, which is generally English. And that leaves us as orphans between languages. My own case was that my mother was, uh, spoke Burmese as her first language because she, was, uh, she grew up in Rangoon. My father spoke Portuguese and Konkani, and they shared no language between them. And so therefore, this, uh, what we spoke at home, all four of us, was English. And to me, the English world seemed rich and vibrant and lively enough for me. When I went to school, I, I, you would think, since we studied English, Hindi, Marathi, and then later French, I would have become adept in one of those other languages through school. I did not. In fact, I discovered that most of the Hindi I knew was Hindi film Hindi. It was language that I had learned at the cinema. And therefore, I could express feelings of love with greater fluency than I could ask for a kilo of potatoes at the local, local shop. Because a kilo of potatoes at the local shop does not generally turn up in, the, in a Hindi film lyric. What turns up is expressions of love. To add to the complexity of the situation, we were told repeatedly when I was growing up that if you only spoke English, you would be lost in India. You would never get a job. You would never amount to anything because English was a loser language. This was told to us repeatedly, okay? And it was told to us by even by our English teachers. So when you won your English prize and was handed over to you, your English teacher said, very good, but look at your Hindi marks and your Marathi marks. What will you do in the world? How will you manage to have a career? And that, in an odd way to a child, firms up your resolution not to study those languages. It makes you doubly determined not to study them. Okay? Then there was the notion of uh, people asking you what was your mother tongue. So my mother tongue actually, the first time I heard this question, I thought is what is the language that your mother speaks? So I said my mother tongue is Burmese. So they said that is not a proper mother tongue. I said, but is there a list of proper mother tongues? Not that I did. You're eight years old, you're not going to ask questions like that, but it's inside you. Inchoately, there's a question that is saying, how can you reject what I am saying about myself? This is my identity that you have asked me about. I have shared my identity, and you are telling me that it is an improper identity. So then the person who was asking me this question said, OK, I have to fill out this form, and I need to know your mother tongue. What language does your mother speak? So I said English, because that's the language my mother spoke. And they said, that's not an, a language also. English is not a mother tongue. 
So then I said, but what do you want me to say? I've offered you two, I didn't know what to say. So another uh, teacher intervened and said, don't keep asking him questions. He is a Pinto, he is from Goa. His mother tongue is Konkani. I had never heard a word of Konkani in my life up to then. Many of my, my cousins, if they were asked about Konkani, would say things like, I can speak it to the servants. Because Konkani was the language you spoke to the servants, Portuguese was the language that the comprador class in Goa spoke to each other. So we were the comprador class and therefore we spoke Portuguese to each other. And the greatest delight in the world was to go to Lisboa and to be told that your Portuguese was beautiful and it was aristocratic, mainly because it was like the Hindi spoken by the, or the Bhojpuri spoken in Mauritius. If you go and listen to it, it is a beautiful and strange language that has been preserved as it was spoken a hundred years ago. Because there is no living refreshment of it coming from Dilmange Moor and, and other such sources where the language has been, has been changed and, and reformed by use and by interaction with other languages. And so it has retained its originality. So when people hear the Mauritian or the, or the Jamaican speaking Hindi or Bhojpuri, they generally they say, oh, it's so beautiful, it sounds so pure and so authentic. All words about language that we need to be suspicious of. There is no such thing as a pure, authentic language. There are only different muddy streams of human communication that for the purposes of our desperate desire to taxonomize everything into kinds and places we have named as language. Marathi, for instance, it is estimated that between 40 to 60 percent of Marathi comes out of Arabic because of the constant interaction that the Maharashtrians had with the Arabic traders who came, in, uh, or came to the coast. Right? So let's put that aside and let's just look at, therefore then when I came out of school, I left Hindi and Marathi behind with delight. I was relieved to be relieved of them as a burden placed on me. And I studied French, and I studied it so that till today I can say la, la plume de ma tante est dans le jardin de mon père. The, the pen of my aunt is in the f garden of my father. What earthly good does that do me? Nothing at all. But I got my 93%. And at the same time, there were parochial forces at work in Bombay, which were saying, if you don't speak Marathi, you don't belong here. And if you say that to a 14-year-old, the 14-year-old's only response is to say something unprintable, a four-letter word that actually comes out of India. The roots of that four-letter word are in India, bhog, goes across the border and becomes that wonderful F word that we all <laughs> so enjoy. Yeah? So we gave the world that lovely polysemic and wonderful word. Yeah. So you want to say that, and you decide that you are therefore not going to learn Marathi. So there. And then time passes and you mellow and you know, and you begin to become a slightly more, you begin to become who you want to be, you begin to try and achieve who you want to be. And you begin to realize then that you have had a buffet in front of you. It's a buffet, okay? There is a wonderful array of dishes available. And you have gone to that buffet and every time you are eating chicken masala. Chicken masala for breakfast, chicken masala for lunch and chicken masala for dinner. Day after day it is chicken masala, it is very good chicken masala. But it is still every day chicken masala. And one day you say to yourself, but I can because I can read Devanagari. Because of that education which I despised that made it necessary for me to learn the script of Devanagari, I can read Hindi and Marathi. But I am not going to eat anything but chicken masala, which is English language books. So I think to myself, why can't I read Hindi? Why can't I read Marathi? And then I go out to find Hindi and Marathi books, which is horrible in Bombay. You cannot browse in a Marathi language bookshop. You arrive at a counter that looks very much like the counter of a medical sto store. And you, when you go to a medical store, you don't say, Haan, mujhe char uh, can you show me four or five different paracetamols, please? I'd like to check which paracetamol suits me and what, how, what's the packaging like. You go to the bookshop and you say, 
I want Cobalt Blue by Sachin Tendulkar. I mean Sachin Kundalkar. They say, Cobalt Blue! And someone throws, Cobalt Blue! And he says, Cobalt Blue. Then if you pick it up and you start looking at it, they begin to ask you, like, you want to read it here only? <laughs> huh? So you have to pay immediately because you have got your book. Now just get out of the way. Because behind you, someone is saying, Are Mala, I, I want eight standard Marathi textbooks and whatnot. Everything is sold in that same bookshop. So there's like Dhakkam Bukki and everyone's scrabbling for books. There is no, you know, this I love going to bookshops and smelling books and reading a few pages, you know, which Anglophone people talk about all the time. That's not the way Marathi people buy books. They know what book they want, they come, they buy it, and they go home. Again, finished. Once in a while, there is a sale. And all the books are put out. And no Maharashtrian will go there because those must be the books no one wants. <laughs> Otherwise, why wouldn't they come and just take them right away? Why would they come out to that? So no one goes to that. Only fools like me go to those books sales. And they find that it is Rhonda Byrne, the secret, the, the secret translated into Marathi. Which is therefore, they should be abandoned there on that table. So I started reading Marathi. And I discovered, the other thing I discovered was that both Marathi and Hindi publishers, never mind the bookshops, but the publishers do an astonishingly good job of keeping books in print. The English publishers, and I hope Speaking Tiger's representative is safely outside at this point, but the English publishers are one night stands. The Marathi and Hindi publishers are marriages. They will, obviously, some. <laughs> Someone didn't like that at all. Okay. <laughs> so, Hindi and Marathi, if you go to a Hindi bookshop and you say, I want uh, Pratinidhi Kavitai, Gajanan Mukti Bodh, which came out in 1968, they have a copy. If you say, I want, um, you know, Kafi Azmi's uh, Selected Shairi, they have a copy. It came out 25 years ago and it is still out. You go to a local bookshop in English and you say, Arvind Krishna Mehrotra's The Absent Traveler, please. If you haven't read The Absent Traveler by Arvind Krishna Mehrotra, it is a translation of 13th century Prakrit poetry. It is amazing. Amazing. It's like, for instance, there is one poem in which a, a mother tells her young daughter, Yes, my love, I have married you to an old man. Yes, my love, I have married you to an old man, but the village in which you will live has many bamboo, groove, bamboo groves by the river, and the men are young and at play in the water. <laughs> well, that is called maternal wisdom, if you ask me. You know? Okay, so you go and you ask for a book like this, which is full of these glorious, rich things, and they brought it out, they put it out, and they stopped doing it after the 500 copies were over. Now when Arin, Arvind Krishna Mehrotra is dead, they will bring out his collected poetry. You have to die. <laughs> you can be Kamla Das. And Kamla Das was practically a rock star in her time. You can be Kamla Das and your book will go out of print and it will not come back into print until you're safely dead. That's the English language publishing scene. But the Hindi and Marathi language publishing scene is very different. Baluta came out in 1978. It was a Christmas gift to the, to the Marathi world. It was the first Dalit autobiography ever. Forgive me those of you who've heard this before. In five days' time, 5,000 copies sold out. And it was reprinted in five days' time. Okay? And it is still in print today. It took 30 years for this book to be, public, to be translated. Mainly because someone wanted to translate it and said that they would and didn't. Just didn't for 30 years. When this person who shall be nameless was asked uh, Priya Darkar, but <laughs> if you want the name, was asked, uh, was told Jerry Pinto wants to translate this book. She said, but I'm translating it <laughs> at the rate of one word a decade, presumably. <laughs> she was tra still translating it. She was halfway through Adventures of a Brahmin Priest. If you have not read Adventures of a Brahmin Priest, go find that book. It is practically an eye-opener. The Rani of Jhansi is the one we remember, right? But there was a Raja of Jhansi. 
राजा रानी है तो राजा होगा देर इज द किंग ऑफ झांसी हिज थिंग वॉज टू गेट ड्रेस्ड एज अ वुमन एंड डांस फॉर द कोर्ट so the english resident who was there said i say you know uh, you can't be doing these sort of things you can't like dance for the court and he said but you have put on bangles for all the rulers chudiya pehen li you have put on bangles for all the rulers i'm just doing this this man in 1857 just when the revolution is breaking out decides that he must change his fortune because he's a very poor brahmin so he's going to go to jhansi and he walks through this he's literally a war reporter for 1857 he's walking through this world and it's been translated and of course we haven't read it i'm sure lots of young people in america are reading because <laughs> they seem to read things in america here we don't so i'm saying when i began to realize that my world did not have to be chicken masala every day i began to read in hindi and marathi and gujarati and french i began to read every day all four languages just pure perversity and show offing <laughs> like if you can why shouldn't you right so i would read poetry every day which was like slightly confusing and slightly odd but it took me about 10 years of this reading before i felt i could translate and the translation began at the point at which i got really angry about a book that i was reading uh it was my assistant who brought it to me santosh thorat his name is he brought me this book and he said you know it's an eye opener you have to read it it was written in marathi it was called shala ahe shikshan nahi uh which means we have schools but no education this was the 10th year of the of the sarva shikshan abhiyan 10 years of had happened and the government sent out a whole bunch of of people to examine schools and see whether they were functioning properly So now you know what examining schools and seeing if they are functioning rural schools and functioning properly means. You turn up at the school and you say they are functioning properly, na? The school and the school says, "Ho ho, it's functioning very well." And you say, "Okay, bye, na? I'm going home." And you go home and have a nap. That is how we do our examinations of schools. And if you reach at the school at lunch time, you you expect to be taken out for a good lunch, and you know, and you will give a special remark for that school, but nothing much more than that. One of these chaps is a man called Bhaskar Kulkarni. and he is decided that he is not going to, he is going to examine the schools that he has to examine and he will do it by standing in front of the seventh standard class and giving them a one line dictation and checking how many words they can spell now people do you know devnagari put up your hands okay a good amount of you know devnagari uh, there are four or five ways of doing r the sound r right first Come on, interactive session. This is she. Now they'll all leave. Interactive session. I'm going to change speech. They do. Yar. Come on, first row. Row like that. No. Make shapes. Come on, row. Then second row. Ha. Like that. On top of the head. Then third row. Like that. Downwards. Then fourth row. Ru. Rushi. Four, five ways to do row. in 80% of maharashtra's rural schools in the chandrabha chandrapur district children knew one r after studying that one r after studying 7 years of marathi language education so chandrapur cha jilhyat ami train madhe pravas karto every r was this r despite the fact that you had to use this ra this ra this ra lots of ras every ra was this one ra which is why children don't i say have not studied their own language we have failed language education at every level at every level and this despite the fact that all research shows that up to the age of 7 a child can pick up as many languages as you throw at it we are hardwired to pick up language because language is a survival skill our understanding of the world is transmitted to us through language and it becomes it is fundamentally necessary for the human brain to be able to pick up language so you take a maharashtrian child and you set her down in chennai if she's 5 years old in 5 years 6 months she is speaking fluent Tra- tamil Take the same child after six months and put her down in France, and she's picked up French. 
effortlessly. It may be for only functional French. She may be speaking French of the nation, nature of I want, walk, go. But she can speak it. And she can do it effortlessly, thoughtlessly, without effort, without crying, without saying ah, 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 A, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. She can do it. We just haven't taught them how. It's simple as that. We have failed our communities in language. I took to translation because I wanted to translate that book. It has not yet been published. No one was interested in the failure of language communication in publishing houses which arguably depend for their existence upon literacy. If there is no literate reading, public speaking, Tiger closes down tomorrow. If we are not teaching everybody to read, then we do not have a literate public. How can you not be interested? You cannot be interested. Because who will buy it? So, I translated a book in which a young man walks into a Maharashtrian house and lives in a room on the top floor. The boy of the house falls in love with him and has an affair with him in the room of that house. The girl of the house is not allowed to go to his room on her own, and especially not in the night. So when she falls in love with him, she has an affair with him outside the house. So there's ghare bhaire happening. One affair is at home, one affair is outside. And then one day, of course, the young man walks out of their lives and bro breaks both their hearts. And the result is that they, uh, they then discover this and begin to talk to each other, actually, about perhaps their lives. We don't talk about our sex lives. All of this to tell you that even this book didn't sell tremendously well. You'd have thought, like, you know, sex lives and gay love story and, and heterosexual love story and, and hypocrisy of society and whatnot, and people would be buy, lining up to buy it. Sachin Kundalkar, to make things better, is a Hindi film filmmaker. He makes Hindi films. He makes Marathi films, but still no one bought it. Doesn't matter. So, <laughs> undaunted, I go on to do Baluta. And this is where I come to what I'm talking about today, which is the attempt to inhabit another tongue. How do you inhabit another tongue when your tongue is very much settled around the same time that your personality gets settled? And if we follow the Piaget model, then that's around the age of seven, right? By the time you're seven, pretty much everything of who you're going to be is settled. Which is why the general, you know, those old saws, give me a boy for the first ten years of his life and I will give you the man that comes. So your formative experiences are the most important. This is held, upheld somewhat by Freudian and uh, Jungian analysis, all the rest of that, let's not go there. But your tongue and who you are is fairly much of a done deal. Now what you can do is superficial adjustments to who you are. Those sound superficial, but they're very important and magnificent adjustments, and that includes putting an MA at the end of your name when you come to APU, okay? So don't underestimate those, those, uh, those ones because, you know, they're likely to get you a job and stuff. And getting you a job means getting you a house, which means you become a landowner, which then you get a car, which means you become automobile, you can move yourself around, and all these become ways in which your personality is now inflected in the eyes of other person, but by the age of seven, who you are is settled as far as who you are in your head. Now, who I am in my head is a Roman Catholic Goan boy in from who grew up in what seemed to be the middle class, but not to me. Everybody else thought we were middle class. I thought we were poor. Because like I got clothes twice a year. I got clothes at my birthday, and I got clothes uh, thrice a year. Clothes at my birthday, clothes at Christmas, and I got clothes for school once a year because I outgrew them and my father said, do you have thorns in your backside, all your pants tear, etc, 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 the usual comments. The fact that parents take children for a walk and end up buying them clothes on the walk seems to me like a, astonishing. And we always had five-year clothes, five-year plan clothes, you know, like, I mean, the shorts came up to here because then they could be opened out and you could grow into them. So you had a dark blue line on your light blue shorts, a V on your bum because that was opened out. All that was, and it was not, 
I remember going to college with my best friend Naresh Fernandez, and Naresh Fernandez had light blue trousers which ended in dark blue here, and they were dark blue on the bum also because that's where his mother had opened out the trousers, and no one laughed at him. People just looked and thought, ah, okay, five-year plan clothes. Happens to all of us, Bob, uh, boss, don't worry about it, yeah? So this world, is, this was my world. And my first attempt at inhabiting another world came when Leela Naidu asked me to write her autobiography with her. Now, Leela Naidu is one of God's chosen people. Her mother was a, diploma, was a, a journalist with Le Petit Socialiste in France. Her grandmother was sitting one day drinking tea and someone knocked on the door and she opened the door and it was a stark naked Russian man. I don't know how she knew he was Russian when he was naked. Because, <laughs> but no doubt maybe there was a little emblem somewhere that suggested Russianness on the naked man. And she said, Monsieur, why do you not, do you, will you not come in? It is chilly outside because this is the foothills of the, of the, uh, of the Swiss Alps but on the French side. And so he comes in and says, I did not kill him. So she says, assuredly, Monsieur, will you have some tea and will you wear my husband's uh, dressing gown? So he puts on the dressing gown and this is Prince Vasily, who was one of the men who was supposed to have killed Rasputin in, England, in Russia. Now, you, when she tells you that story, you're thinking, really? <laughs> Meaning like, seriously? And you go home thinking, this is a fabulous story. The next day you go and she say, ah, and I remember the time that, that this young man came to work with us. And my father, used, my grandfather, you see, he was, uh, he was uh, into distributing all over France, how you call it, the, the, the track. Because when she spoke, she became French. <laughs> but if when, say, a, a producer came and asked her, Madam, aap Hindi bol sakti hai? She would say, Beshak. Which language do you want? <laughs> okay? That is the seduction of the actor also. Yeah? Who is it you want me to be? She could see that if she did Beshak with me, I wasn't impressed. But if she did like, like her little French mademoiselle accent, I was like, oh, is that <laughs> charming? So therefore, she was doing the French thing. And she said, yeah, you know, the tractors of, of America, were, we were dis distributing. So this young man came to work with us. And he got angry one day, and he took a, this blazing poker, and he hit another man with it. So my father dismissed him and said, you will never amount to much, much unless you control your temper, Benito. And it was Mussolini who was working for her grandfather. Me, you thinking, like, really? Yeah. And then, of course, you know, when she goes to, she is 17 years old, she's married to Vicky Oberoi of the Oberoi family, and she goes to Paris because she has twins, and, you know, she had, you can't, when you have twins and you're 17 years old, you have to go to Paris because Ingrid Bergman has just delivered twins in Paris to a great doctor who, you must, of course, go to that same doctor, and you must live with Ingrid Bergman, and you're wearing your Naulakha Har, and it breaks and it falls all over the George Sank hotel floor, and who is there to pick it up for you? Monsieur Cartier himself, <laughs> who says, ah, these pearls, but I sold them to the Begum of something, something. <laughs> She's thinking, I, can, I cannot write this because I will have to verify all these facts <laughs> myself. If I say, then Leela Naidu went to Paris. So what do I do? I say, okay, I am writing this as if I am Leela Naidu. Now she is saying it. I didn't say it. I, Leela Naidu. But now I must become, in my head, Beshak. <laughs> I must become. So I, once I said to her, Leela, you were one of the ten most beautiful women in the world, Vogue magazine said. One of the five most beautiful. <laughs> okay, I got that down. Thank you. I wrote that down. Cancel ten, write five on top. Not that it matters, of course, you know. After all, beauty is just a matter of the inheritance of the genes and the carriage of the personality, you know. So, now, here I am a greasy 38-year-old. I was 38 when I wrote the book, not saying I'm 38 now. But I was a greasy 38-year-old boy from Mahim. And this is a woman who grew up in finishing schools. And, you know, when she goes to Paris, uh, Ingrid Bergman introduces her to Truffaut. And Truffaut introduces us to Renoir. And they all go out for drives. And then some woman jumps into the Seine. And then Truffaut jumps in to rescue her and pulls her out. And she says, oh, why did you save me? Why did you save me? So Renoir says, throw her in again. <laughs> 
was just like, what a life. How am I? My best compliment came after the book when Sunil Sethi at Outlook magazine said, you can hear Leela's voice in the book. So I thought, oh, there you go then. I did a good job of being a 65-year-old retired beauty who, who lives in, you know, like, who had Louis Mal come over and, you know, played music for Louis Mal and, and who was painted and put up in very, by Jatin Das and various other people. It was a wonderful time. We opened a cupboard to find photographs of, of Leela Naidu and the first thing that comes out is an autographed picture. The picture is autographed by Imelda Marcos. <laughs> for Leela, Imelda Marcos. <laughs> it's a great, great and, and just a world I had no access to. So I had to pretend to be Leela Naidu when I wrote it. What did that mean? I had to pretend to be a woman. Is that very different from being a man? Now here is a whole bunch of feminists looking at me eagerly waiting for that answer. Do you think I'm stupid? <laughs> Do you think I'm even going to try? I'm not. I wrote it imagining myself as an object, an objective person, but I tried not to let myself get in the way of myself. There is me, a very clear me, and that very clear me has to be put down sometimes as an act of egolessness. Writing is often, and this, I, have, I will say it with full knowledge, writing is often narcissistic, solipsistic. It is often the desire to present oneself as the best possible deal of oneself, which is why if you don't like me, I can take it. But you don't like my writing, I'm broken, I'm hurt by that. Because that me in the writing is the, es the essential, refined, me that I have pushed out of myself, I have extruded at personal cost, and I have worked on making it likable even when I'm being bratty. Even when you are saying you are constructing an anti hero, when you're Michel Huelbeck writing as a bratty, I hate you kind of person, you are still asking for liking. You are still asking for appreciation, right? So when if, you, if this is the reason why you are writing, you are unfit for ventriloquism, for acts of ventriloquism. You cannot be the kind of person who writes someone else's autobiography, and you certainly cannot translate. Because in translation, the first thing that happens in the room, in the, in the sanctum sanctorum of the writer's head, is the knocking down of the deity of the self, and the establishing of Dayapavar as the new deity for that project. If I am translating Baluta, you have not come to read Dayapa, Jerry Pinto writing Baluta. You have come for Dayapavar's Baluta. The best possible solution would be for you to read Baluta in the original Marathi. This because Marathi is one of many language possibilities in that muddied stream of communication thing that we are talking about, and you are not comfortable in that stream, perhaps English would be the next best alternative because you have an English translation now. Does that mean that uh, there's been a loss? Oh, huge, huge, okay? But is that loss worth it or not worth it? A is for Akhmatova. B is for Basho, C is for Kavafi, D is for Dostoevsky, E is for Euripides, F is for Ferrante, G is for, you name the author that you love, and I'll, Gorky, H is for Hollande, T is for Tsvetsaya, U is for Ungaretti, M is for Montale. There are thousands and hundreds of authors we have read, including Tintin, including Goskini and Uderzo's Asterix and Oblix comics, including Tulsi Das's Ramayan, including the four Gospels of Jesus, written originally in Demotic Greek. Jesus speaks Aramaic, but Greek is the local English of the world then. And so three of them don't speak Greek well are still writing Greek and translating Jesus already into the original 
from the original Aramaic into Greek to present it to us, and the first great miracle of translation. There must be other miracles of translation. I'm sure we will, uh, someone will inform me about other miracles, but is the Septuagint, where 70 scholars are translating and produce the same version at the same time, right? Now, if we take away translation from our world, we get a chicken masala world. We get a world in which we will be, and even that chicken masala world, without my recognizing it, had already become, there's a wonderful story, story about Malayalam, which I love deeply, because one day the Malayalam newspaper decided to carry, a, to c conduct a poll in which they said, which is your favorite Malayalam like author, favorite Malayali author. And overwhelmingly, the response was Gabriel Garcia Marquez. And why should they not? Why should you not? That's the man you love reading. He's been translated into Malayali. He's been translated well into Malayali, obviously. You're reading him. You're loving him. He's your favorite author in Malayali. Why do you need to have someone who was, who was born in Kerala and grew up with his toes in the red mud of the rivers? You're reading. That's your act. It's a personal, individual, private act. Have you noticed how people will try not to let you see the spine of the book they are reading? It's very odd. There's something very private about it and they, I, I need to know. So I will turn my head and look like that and whatnot. And the more they get aware of this, the more they fold the book over so that <laughs> I don't see it. So finally I just ask, what are you reading? <laughs> and some people just say, why do you want to know? And this is because I'm terminally curious, I will die if you don't tell me. And my blood will be on your hands. And then they smile and they say, huh, I'm reading Manual of Self-Improvement. <laughs> How to become a better person and answer stupid questions like yours without getting angry. Some, some, generally, it's not a very exciting book, but I mean, I'm still interested. But reading is a very private, intimate, personal thing. And therefore, Tra writing is an even more private, intimate, personal thing until you throw open the door and let another voice in. Now, this other voice has a great, great consolation attached to it. The consolation of companionship. Writing is lonely. And writing is also... See, when I said, you know, the extruding the self, etc., etc., it became so honest, you know? It became like, this is who I am, and, and I'm squeezing my amness, and I'm putting my amness down, and it is becoming ampapered. <laughs> Dirty joke. Sorry, it is becoming like a, it is becoming such a clean, pure thing. Actually, my amness is now passing through many filters. And one of the filters is, how do I sound? Do I sound intelligent enough? And the other filter is, am I sophisticated enough? And the other filter is, is this too much revelation? And various filters like that are stopping me, and then the product happens, right? And in many of the edits that I do, that is the, the, the way of looking turns from that essentialness, that what I want to say into what I want to appear to be saying. How do I want to look, right? There's a great difference there, a shift there. When you're writing, you're translating, you don't care. It's how do you want, how did you want to appear? So I'll give you an example. I'm now translating a book called Ye Kothe Waliya. Ye Kothe Waliya means those dancing girls. Dancing girls, repositories of Indian classical music tradition. Dancing girls, prostitutes. Dancing girls, caste-based profession. Dancing girls, performers. Dancing girls, all of the above, threat to society, dancing girls, people who we need to go out and save from their terrible, you know, from the terrible horror of their lives. All this is what dancing girls. Now, Amrutlal Nagar, who wrote this book in Hindi, takes a very Gandhian view of dancing girls. And Gandhi's view of dancing girls was like everything Gandhi does, sweetly and incredibly mixed up. So first, Gandhi says, every time I see a prostitute or a dancing girl or a kothewali, I think of my own masculinity and my lusts and how the lusts of men have made these women who they are, so I hang my head in shame. <laughs> Good enough. I think we all should, and that is all. But though, incredibly, if you passed a housewife, you should be able to do that also. <laughs> you know, this is also what we did to, what men did to women. So, but why dancing girls? But that's one. 
Then the other thing is, dancing girls must take up spinning khadi. Once they have spun enough khadi, they will be pure and they will be wonderful. Third, dancing girls are a threat to society. And they are enticing young men away from their families and seducing them. And they are infiltrating them with lusty thoughts. All these dancing girls can do in Gandhi's view. Now, Amrutlal Nagar is a good Gandhian. So what is his opinion? This All prostitution will end because young women are now giving it away for free. This feminism, no, that is happening. And free love movement. Women are not asking to get married now. They are just having sex with young boys. So why young boys have to pay prostitutes? All prostitution will end because young women are giving it to... <laughs> like reading this and thinking, Amrut Lal! You really don't mean this, do you? But he does. He's very serious. And he thinks this is the probable end of prostitution is in... Young women, modern young women. Now, the book also has some fabulous one on one conversations with great singers, great musicians, women who are reputedly known Husna, Badi Moti Bai, um, Vidyadhari, who was still alive, 90 and still alive. Great singers, but it also has this. I wish he hadn't said this. I wish he just interviewed those women. Then he's asking the women, what do you think should be done about these Kothe Valleys? Now he's asking Kothe Valleys, what should be done? So the women who are trained, I think, in pleasing men, think, what do you think he would want us to say? He'd want us to say they should be reformed, na? He's wearing khadi. So they probably judge that he wants and he says, yes, so they should be reformed. And he says, ha, ah, you are very correct. They should be reformed. And they should be taken. Everyone's suggesting wild things. Pick up all the Kothewalis from one city and take them to another city. Then make them work 12 hours a day non-stop. So they will never have a chance and then they are very tired and they will just go to sleep. <laughs> Union labor? 12 hours of work a day? Who are we talking about here? Now, this is the book that I'm translating. It's a shocking and horrifying book. But it is a reflection of how the middle class and Gandhi's middle class looked at the problematic figure of the Tawaif. The problematic figure. It is a problem. It's always going to be a problem. Yeah? So that many of my friends work with point of view in various other places. How long do I have? It's about three. Five minutes and then questions? Yeah, Q&A, okay. So when you are inhabiting another voice, now you are inhabiting Amrutlal Nagar's voice. His voice is often repugnant to me. Repugnant. Malika Amar Sheikh. I want to destroy myself. Magnificent book. Truly magnificent. Out, perhaps in the, in the non- English Indian languages, the first account of domestic violence done to a woman by a Dalit who was one of the great leaders of the Dalit movement. That's a difficulty. How do you deal with someone who is taking down her husband when her husband is a Dalit leader, Namdev Dhasal? It's an incredible, he was supposed to be working on his autobiography, I read somewhere. And that would have been wonderful to be able to look at these two things together and see what he says about the fact that he, you know, he impregnated her with, with ven he gave her venereal disease. But he didn't even leave enough money for her to have the shots necessary. She goes and borrows the, shot, the money for, for, her, for her antibiotics from a station worker, but who's a comrade. And so it lends her the money. It's heartbreaking, that book. And it, it is also deeply honest. You, there is no attempt, Malika makes no attempt at saying, I was a brave woman who fought and struggled. She says, I tried to do this. I finished, didn't finish this course. I tried to type, learn typing. I didn't finish that course. 
I tried to learn this. I didn't finish that because she was not a finisher. She's a, she was flailing. And she talks about her flailing bravely and honestly. In almost everything we do, I think there will be the overwhelming reason to do it is because I suspect, I think of the Anglophone reader as someone who is isolated on a small island. It's an incredibly rich island. And it can make you forget that there are other islands. And around these islands, there are turbulent rivers. And the translator is in a boat made of salt. But the Anglophone island needs that salt. We need to be reading in other tongues. We can't. I, can't, I would love to have learned Tamil and Kannada and, uh, and Bengali. Because they seem, you know, I arrive in the city, I'm at Chandan's house, again, shelf after shelf of, of, of books. And I'm thinking, so much, so much to read. And none of this probably, maybe 1% translated. I'd love to be able to read all of them. I'm, I go to, uh, to uh, my friend Arundhati's house in, in Tamil Nadu, shelf after shelf of, of lovely books in Tamil. I go to Manoj Menon's house in Kerala, shelf after shelf of books in Malayalam, no access. So we need translation until we develop this multiphonic, multilingual abilities, which we are, you know, which considering the nature of our enterprise in language, considering the nature of our education in language, considering the nature of, of the disease of English that is at present rampant in the country, considering all these things that are happening to us is unlikely to happen. So for that reason, I row the boat of salt across the river, and I try to bring salt to the Anglophone world. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask. <laughs> Anything you want to ask, including how much money do you make and whatever. All kinds of questions, acceptable and agreeable. And the teachers are leaving so you can be free. <laughs> Just run, run, I know you have class. Blah, 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 blah. Huh? Huh? Yes, please. Oh, nice. I'm so glad they're not bottles. Huh? Say, say anything you want. Don't feel not afraid. Where did you get your shirt also acceptable? <laughs> yeah. ah, say. Thank you. Jesus. Say, say. Uh, why the uh, writer's, uh, writer finds this necessary to distinguish between how he finally appears to the reader and what he is? So that distinction that you made between you know, how you appear to be and how okay. you are. That um, Hemingway used to call it, uh, say that one of the things that we have uh, that writers need to have is their sh uh, a shit meter, a detector for the shit that you write. And I believe that that, that uh, detector, the shit detector, is developed by reading. The more you read, the more you begin to refine your sensibility about language, and the more you can tell good language from bad language, and then you don't want to be a perpetrator of further bad language. You get it? So that's one level. I want to see, be seen, every writer from the lowest on the heap, the chaps who write Colonel Ranjit and things like that, okay, right up to, uh, you know, Niralaji or Tagore or whoever your exemplar is, everybody wants to write well. Everybody. Because we want to do everything well. You think, almost all of you assuredly believe that the, the assignments you submit need A's, right? They should get A's. Because you wrote so well. You may have done your whole assignment in 20 minutes before submission time. That, 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 writing down whatever you can. Checking word count every five minutes, frantically thinking, are you just 300 words? I was writing for hours. Hours, no, you wrote for 10 minutes. But you think at the end you finished and submitted it. For this much work, they should give any. Now understand this, if there is compassion on the other side and memory on your teacher's side, they will remember doing pretty much the same shit. <laughs> Most of the time. On the other hand, if there is no compassion and memory, they will give you what you deserve, which is, what is failing? F. 
U A to U grades. <laughs> My God, that's baroque. Oh, the U is unacceptable, or something. Okay. Ninety-eight percent of the assignments you submit are retarded rubbish. You know this because you have not put any work into them, or you have put the minimal effort into them. Yeah, and you have got it done and sent it in. Finished. Asked for an assignment, not take now. <laughs> Whoever benefited from these assignments, I don't know. You have said to yourself. But when the assignment comes into your hand with a C, oh, he gave me a C. Really? Okay. All this is going on. Now writers are not very different. Writers also want to finish in patli gali and do it, but there's something that restrains you, which is only one thing. which is my name will be on this my name will be on this and it will go out in public and many you have seen me and you may like me or dislike me that's not the point but you have seen me most people will not see me they will only see my book and they will my book becomes my ambassador my representation the only thing they know about me is whether i write well or i write badly is in that book so i jolly well better put what i can into that book Okay, I must make it the best possible thing because it goes out carrying my name. If each one of you would do this with your assignments, if you say to yourself, "This carries my name and becomes my representative and my ambassador," you will change your attitude to your assignments. You will do your best possible work because they are your representatives to your teachers. But most people won't because. we are average we are on the bell curve all of us okay so i like to be on the top 10% so i will do my best to try and be there but often my best is not good my best is limited by who i am and the person on the other side if say for instance uh, someone in tyba is reading my book they may say oh very good language he has someone who is doing his phd may look at my book very differently so a book and a reading moment what when does a book become a book a book doesn't become a book when i published it and put it out a book becomes a book when i you open it you start reading it and you have a response then the circuit is completed my plug otherwise i am a radio which has not been plugged in as soon as i plug into you and you're reading my book suddenly the book happens when you start reading it that's when the book happens and then you become part of it what energy have you brought to the book What time did you start reading the book? Where were you when you started reading it? What was your receptivity like? Do you have a if you're reading I'm in the big room, is there a mental health problem in your family? Is that making you more receptive to it? Or is it making you feel like ah this he's not doing a good job. I I can write better than this. All that counts in factors in. So when you are doing your best, okay? You know it's a failure. But you're still because all creativity is the noble failure. is a noble failure you will fail but on the basis of your failure other failures better failures will be erected that is our belief that each writing experience is only one step in an endless procession of steps and you have to accept your position as one of the steps that's all does that answer the question in any way yeah anyone else yeah on the front page and then over there <coughs> sorry uh, so you've talked about how we've not <coughs> given much relevance to the language studies as such mm -hmm, mm -hmm. language studies yeah or usage of the language so um, <coughs> so when you look at writers like waika mohammad bashir in kerala you can't literally translate his works because it consists completely of the malabar essence the slang of that area and you cannot definitely do that but uh, in my academic years i remember reading a um, english translation of bhuvana uh, manana bhuvana manana Work, yeah, yes. There's one big one. And my granddad had an elephant. <laughs> yes, uh, and <laughs> Bhumi de Avagashigal, yeah. Honours of the Earth. So, both of these books were really badly translated, and it lost completely the essence of the book, the essence of the plays, or anything that he wanted to talk about in through the book. So, don't you think in that way translation is a crime committed against the language? Endlessly. Or, so, so how do you uh, justify, you know, the existence of this so whole academic sector? The same way. Okay. Very good question. all sexual intercourse says andrea dworkin is tantamount to rape 
because there is penetration of a man of a woman by a man we justify this on the basis of the fact that there are children born of that and that the continuity of the human race is dependent upon rape that's the justification of human sexual activity from any extreme perspective everything is a crime you read the hidden life of trees and vegetarianism is a crime trees respond to giraffes eating them by releasing in their leaves a, a strong smelling scent that makes the giraffe unwilling to eat it now giraffes also know this because once they have nibbled from one tree what they do is they move downwind because the trees will release this warning signal to other trees peter wollenberg who wrote the book found a 300 year old tree living simply because other trees were feeding it it had fallen everything else was gone but the stump of the tree was being fed by other trees what is not a crime looked at in some way consider this in the first translation i did bhaskar kulkarni goes out to a village school and asks the children take your ruler and make a circle they say no no we've got compass we'll make he says no take your ruler and make a circle they say we can't do it he goes outside to a old woman who is sitting there unlettered and says take this ruler and make a circle she puts it on the ground and spins it she's made a circle education is a crime we have taken that child consider this take your 3 year old nephew for a walk all kinds of questions what is that why is it that how is it that what is the sky why is it blue what is blue why choose blue but why but why but why take your 10 year old nephew for a walk what do you learn in school nothing <laughs> come na tv time come on let's go na i don't like the park is boring school is a, a crime take the best years of your life right now you're living the best years of your life what are you doing writing assignments bade zulm tha rahe ho someone is is taking everything away from you you'll finish this and you'll go out and get a job the day will be bright and beautiful outside bangalore will be smelling lovely microcraft breweries are making new beers and you will be at a computer <laughs> when will you finish 59 retirement age the breweries will be there but you will not be allowed to drink them because your liver is now bad <laughs> doctor saying no 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 what is not a crime tell me in the organized society that we live what is not a crime and if everything is a crime then is translation a good crime or a bad crime <laughs> if it were for me to say i would say good crime because i am a translator why should you believe me tomorrow a thief will say you know how much money do you have today right now in your purse i'm saying how much approximately 300 they the thief will give you some money but i'm walking around with 9000 rupees in my pocket and the thief says equal opportunities and you know like equalizing opportunity and equalizing resources let me take 5000 rupees from your pocket let me steal 5000 rupees and i i also need some money today so is that a crime when mr ambani does it is it a crime who paid water why is the government charging you a water bill it's their water but tomorrow water may be privatized which will be the crime so then there are good crimes and bad crimes a good translation is a good crime a bad translation is a bad crime so for the sake of those translations which are good for the sake of those teachers who can inspire curiosity rather than diminish it for the sake of institutions that produce thinking 
empathetic, communicated, communicating students and workers, education is not a crime. But otherwise, at a certain level, you decide whether what you do is a crime or not. You decide every day. Every day, you decide whether you're going to be a criminal or not. Do you know the name of the enabler who is on your floor? Do you know the name of the security guard at the gate? You're a contemptible snob. These are human beings who are making your life possible. Do you know their names? You are a criminal also. It is easy to spot crime in other people. It is very difficult to spot it in oneself. Yeah, question. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is connected to a little bit connected to the previous question that you answered, and which was basically the artwork representing the writer or the finished work representing the writer. But there's this whole other debate of artist and artwork. Uh, should we look at a finished product and artwork without looking at the artist or what, that whole debate? I'm just curious to find out what you feel about it. For example, if I pick up M and the Big Home and I love the book, and should I be asking what kind of a person Jerry Pinto is? Or should I be concerned about that at all? This is a very good question. Okay. As a human tribe, we do two things which are good for the world. We shit, which is very good fertilizer. It grows trees, it nourishes plants. It is very good. Not in the middle of the room, <laughs> not even in a bathroom of the kind with a flush toilet, but out in the open, as Gandhi said, with a small spade, cover it with, lag, with this thing. That's the first thing. The second is we make art. It may not be good for the world, but it's good for us. Now, when we make art, we understand that the person making art is human. Human. Let us say, this human being has flaws. Are the flaws important or is the art important? Often, when you discover, for instance, have you seen Nanette, everybody? Put up your hands if you've seen Nanette. Yeah. So Nanette ends with this magnificent, you know, Picasso says that uh, she was 17 and I was 40 and she was in her prime and no young girl, no girl at 17 is ever in her prime. And Picasso is, was like a pedophile for having done this. And therefore, cubism is not valuable. Therefore, Picasso is not valuable. Therefore, cubism will continue to be valuable for me. Okay? Because if every artist's life is examined, they are all going to prove to be human beings. And all of us will have done shit. We will all have done bad stuff. And we will have to throw all art out of the window. And that will denude and deprive our lives. We must be mature enough to be able, I think, to say yes, the artist is flawed but the art is art. If you cannot say that, I don't, I get it. I understand. I have no, um, what's the word for it? I have no, no feeling that, oh, no, 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 you must understand it my way. If you say tomorrow you look at Renoir, or you look at Hussein, and, or you look at, um, I don't know, you read a great poem, and the person turns out to be an RSS supporter, and this is unacceptable to you. Then you throw out the poem and you say, I will never read that poem again. That's your attitude. I'm not, I'm not arguing with it. I'm saying it's not my attitude. My attitude is we are all human. We all screw up multiple times. And sometimes in great moments, we do art that is so spectacular that it can enrich someone else's life. I want that art in my life, but I don't need your human frailties. I can, I can manage a, a negotiation with your art and with your frailties at the same time because I expect that from other people too. I expect them to know that I'm human, that I will mess up, but I will also make art. And I will hope that they will accept both of these things. 
And I should be punished for what I do wrong, if it is legally wrong, if it is legally wrong by the time. But, but that's what I think. Now, anyone thinks differently, I'm willing to listen to your arguments and I'm willing to say, also at the end I will say, yes, I understand where you're coming from. Understand that it hurts very much sometimes to discover that you know someone you, whose work you've loved is not lovable. That person is not lovable, but the work is. Can we separate the two? I'm asking you this, okay. So you have a great cook at home. But your cook is a Sanghi. He's an RSS person. Would you say, I cannot have my RSS person cooking my food? I'm asking. And if we can exempt food, it's exactly the same thing as like writer's block. People ask me, oh, do you get writer's block? I say, do cooks get cook's block? I cannot cook today because I have cook's block. You'd keep a cook like that? And cooking is a creative activity, so is writing. So if you can keep a cook who's a sanghi and say, just don't talk to me about politics, make nice aloo sabzi and come, and then go home. I don't see why you can't say, you know, if you're a sanghi, I can still read your book, but I don't like your politics. But it's, oh, I don't like your sexuality, or I don't like your, your behavior, or I don't like the fact that you're a criminal, or I th don't like the fact that you're a Nazi, or I don't like the fact that X, Y, and Z. I don't see the reason, but I can see, understand why people would feel that way, because the intimate relationship that we have with works of, that we love, artworks that we love, so then when the artist also is lovable, that rejoices our heart. But the artist is despicable, it makes us feel like violated in a way because you gave space in your heart to something and now that person turns out to be some horrid, dirty beast. So you want to throw out everything and I think sometimes the baby goes with the dishwater, with the bath water. Yeah? That's my attitude. Not arguing with anyone else who thinks otherwise. Someone else had a question? Or we can, oh yes, please. And then there's a, a red shirt over here. But first, go ahead. Uh, you need uh, mic, mic, mic. They need to tape it for evidence in case they need. So, uh, considering the current education system, when you spoke about the language education, especially in uh, the ages of uh, six to fifteen. How do you think uh, we can, 6 to 15, the elementary education, so uh, how, how, how can we bring in that multiple language learning uh, to children, any ways that you think of? First, get the teacher out of the room. <laughs> Seriously, language can be learned in a number of ways, including lots of cinema. I'd say lots of films. All the Hindi and Marathi I learned, most of it came out of cinema. Which is why I say, you know, I mean, mohabbat, prem, pyar, I have like hundreds of words for. I have no idea what, I mean, other than kantha langot, I don't know what tie is in Hindi. Yeah. So, I'm saying, I think, can we make language education seriously the realm of fun? All the time. The problem is that we're very suspicious of fun. We think it's really bad for you. Even when there is something fun that you do, like popular culture, we take it and we do Roland Barth. <laughs> Jouissance, you know, French words are put on top. So I think language, you say, if you consider how language is taught, it's also taught from grammar. Main hoon, tu, hai, wo, hai, je suis, tu, hai, il, hai, el, hai, nous so, vous êtes, il, so, el, so. Say again, je suis, tu, hai, il, so. When I was learning Urdu, I finished learning the alphabet with great difficulty because I was 40 when I started learning Urdu. Okay? So like 7 and 7 and 40. And my teacher was a man with no imagination at all. <laughs> Meaning he had the imagination of a, of a butterfly. <laughs> so as soon as we finished learning the first, the, uh, the script, he brought me the Urdu primer from the first standard. And I'm reading. मेरे पास एक तोता है, टैं 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 करता है। And I looked at him and he said, हाँ हाँ, खूब खूब। I'm thinking, खूब? 
आई लॉन्ट उर्दू टू से मेरे पास एक तोता है टैंक 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 करता है आई यू मैड बट इसे नहीं तो सिखाऊ कैसे हाउ कैन आई टीच यू इफ आई डोंट आई सेट विथ पोइट्री ही सिंह आई सेट आई एम फोर्टी वेरियस डर्टी जोक्स ऑल्सो अकर्ट टू मी अबाउट सेंग मेरे पास एक तोता है बट टै 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 नहीं करता है आजकल बट आई डिट नॉट because he was not a he was not the kind who could make those kind of jokes too so then what i did was i went out and i got a, a ghalib and i said ye padhenge together and we started again with that and and it it was a little better and you know like from time to time he would put his glasses down and say bahut sharab ki iska zikr karta hai ye islam mein nahi hota hai sharab i want to say like okay but <laughs> because Galib, Galib is just taking us off to the mekhana all the time, and, and someone is pouring one more jam, you know, happily. And here is you know, my Maulvi Sahab was most uncomfortable with all this, but still we got on a little better. So I'm saying, even when you're at forty, you're suddenly मेरे पास एक तोता है टैं टैं टैं. How do you expect people to enjoy or love their language when you are doing this to them all the time? You know. Why in the fifth standard in Marathi we have a utha mula utha mula poem, which is about get up child, get up child, look it is morning already. Who, which child needs to? Do chik. Meaning, what stupidity we do to children? Main banjara le ik tara ghuma Bharat sara. Really? Really banjara? You're so suspicious of gypsy communities and nomadic communities. Suddenly, they have become your spokesperson. <laughs> Our hypocrisy is endless. So I think we actually, and actually, there is another, another far more fundamental problem. I think it is the economy of information in our world. Um, the problem, I think, is that we really are not. convinced of the efficacy of education on a mass basis we don't know if it is applicable to everybody we don't know if it is a good idea for everyone to be able to speak the language and to speak it well because to speak it well is to think well and to think well is to be able to penetrate double speak to become fully equipped citizens thinking citizens and no government has ever wanted that thinking citizens or you might ask why everyone talks about how important education is but education has never crossed 3% of the gdp or the budget you might wonder someone has a question yeah. um there's an entire discourse on how gender is a lived experience and how you need specific languages language tools rather to be able to speak about it like for example kiksu has a reach of feminine or thing and now there's a emerging discourse about even language is a lived experience so how would your position as an outsider necessarily inhibit or enhance the process of translating these lived experiences <coughs> fundamentally the same question as the criminal question um because we are an outsider to everyone else because this attempt to monolithize women which has been ongoing for dec centuries is the same attempt that is to monolithize dalits or to say that there is a hindu or there is a muslim as soon as you examine closely those identities they collapse the muslim says i am a bohri the muslim says i am a meman i am a khoja i am a sunni i am a shia i am a gujarati i am a i am a i am a gujarati who was converted in the 12th century i am i'm this i'm that i'm the ashrawi elite and muslim is one part of my identity now let us establish that let us take it as a muslim woman which is given priority muslim or woman in muslim which is given priority sunni or shia if sunni then which of the various sunni definitions can you have so at some fundamental level we should all accept outsider status to everybody else 
And therefore, everything becomes an ambassadorship. It becomes an invitation. It becomes a, an attempt at negotiation, an attempt, attempt at connection. These, by their nature, will fail. The same thing that she said, criminal, un unacceptable, true, all true. Is there need for another language? Yes. Is that language being developed? No. Why is it not being developed? I don't know. If it is so screaming necessary, why isn't someone developing it? In what sense is it? It is not being developed, you would say, because there is no uh, impetus behind it. What is the impetus behind a language? The need to communicate the extreme specificity of a situation, a moment. Therefore, in Sanskrit, Vaidhurya represents the blue at the base of the lotus, but nothing else. No other blue. Only other possible use for it is the shadow of Krishna on the breast of Radha, producing the same color blue, but argued repeatedly. The Rig Veda, for instance, has just been translated into a 4,000 page book. In the 3rd century B, uh, AD, a scholar says, these poems are too old for us to understand anymore. 3rd century. 1700 years later, someone's translating what the 3rd century scholar, Sanskrit scholar has said, cannot be understood any longer. We will fail all the time. But each failure of ours, each loss has to become, we have to fail in order to provide the detritus, the soil, the compost, the manure for the next step, which will fail in its time. And which, because see, if you think about it, for five minutes, you will reject the label that someone else is giving you because the label someone else is giving you is a, has a freight load of their assumptions about, about you. So I can say she is a woman and she can say, what do you mean by that? And I can say, well, quite simply, you have XX chromosomes. And she'll say, no, language is not quite so simple. It is not quite so scientific. When you say woman, you have many other things that you're thinking about you're thinking about. Now, I can say, that's an assumption you're making. And she'll say, yes, but it's an assumption based on the fact that many other people have used this, and therefore, by inductive logic, if not by deductive logic, your usage of this thing is the same as theirs. Now, I withdraw woman as a label. What is your label, I ask? She says, I don't want a label. But what is my taxonomy going to do then? And taxonomy has been very often critiqued and severely critiqued as a male enterprise. Great, no issues with that. Don't go asking your doctor what's wrong with you. Because if he has to name a virus, he has to use a ta taxonomy. But your taxonomy is male-centric. We can't have that ta taxonomy. Yes or no? I don't know. It is the same as people saying to me constantly, you know, when we are on a flight, Western science has ruined this country. Newton's law, force is equal to mass into acceleration, energy goes that way, plane goes this way, is supporting this plane. Would you rather not have that? and go home by bullock cart? Sure. We can't cherry pick these things. So in the critique, the solution is not in, I think, in the blaming, but in the renaming. So you, what you need to do is develop that language. And how do you develop that language? My uh, understanding of it is start speaking a new language, which, is, which means rework the th things that upset you. Respeak. I had, and most people, when I say this, people say, but we need funding to speak. Really? Good God. 
No, because you know, then otherwise, uh, how will I live? By doing a job, like everybody else did. Just get on with it. Do the work. The language upsets you, the male-centric language, phallogocentric language upsets you, it upsets me too. But I work with it. I work with it as a given. And I hope that you will work with it as not a given. And as a maid, a remade. But now, urgently, this day, you start remaking the language to your necessity and specifications. In your head, in your mind, in your speaking, in your writing, you d we do this. Because that's how we do it. That's how language is made. It is never going to be made in an institution. Only the French have an academy where they let in words after one year, and you know, men, and it's all men. All men meet and talk about it. Well, out on the, world, on the road, people are saying le bois, la bois frion, the boyfriend, le, le weekend, le drugstore, le jogging. They're using English words, but they won't go into the dictionary until the French Academy. That's not how language develops. Language develops in our tongues, in our hearts, in our minds. Utilize the resources in your hearts, in your tongues, in your minds to remake the language into the language that you want. Simple. Go for it. Feel free. Butt heads. Take on. But if you say, oh, but your language was made by men? Yeah, sure, it was. What are you doing about it? And if you can't do anything about it, as top of the pyramid, who will? Question? Uh, what time do we stop? 3.30? Last question and then we go. Say, say, say. Jane yaar. Don't talk in between. Sir, can you... Uh Tell us some of the uh, translation projects that you did not take and why didn't you take them? Did not take them. See, most of the time, what... Okay. Uh, let's just, for a moment, let me talk about the hindrances to translation. One is that there's no money. Okay? So, you subsidize the translation. Basically, it takes me about a year to translate a book. A year, year and a half sometimes. And I get 20,000 rupees for that work. That's it. And 20,000 rupees goes to the author of the book or his heirs or whatever. So that means if in a year, if I'm making 20,000 rupees, I get 2,000 rupees a month. So most of the books that I do not translate, okay, a book has to urgently call to me and has to say, you, you have to translate me. Often what happens is halfway through reading a book, I will start, just a sentence will pick up and I'll be thinking, in English, what would you do with this? No, 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 no. Okay, not, not too straight, because the language itself is twisted. So the first line of Cobalt Blue is a line which reads perfectly fluently in Marathi, but in English, it, the, the gist of it is that you should not be here when something we both wanted to happen is finally happening is nothing new for me. And it's a very clever line, because always we have wanted the loved one, the moment, the jug of wine, the empty house, the music playing, the, the late evening sun setting, and the loved one. And all this is happening except the loved one. It's a lovely line, but to get that into English took me a week of work, just thinking about it. So if it isn't calling to you desperately, saying, I want, I want in on your time and space and energy, I don't do it. So I read about, for every one book that I translate, I'll read 10 books that I will, that will go past me, that I'll say, mm, lovely, glad I read that, but it's not talking to me. And some books talk to me that are completely like, when you finish doing it, I think, really, you? Okay, but you happened. You know, why not? It's like having children, I suppose. <laughs> you surprise your parents a bit. <laughs> like they didn't bargain for this, but it happened. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Enjoyed talking to you. Yeah, thank you.